Secret Invasion Episode 4, the one that's unintentionally funny. Us brothers gotta stick together, you know what I mean? And you thought you'd demonstrate that by breaking and entering. <laughs> this episode's got everything. It's got the people who are bringing about the apocalypse talking about how they can convince everyone that they're the good guys. Show them our hearts. Fury and his wife working out how to go through a divorce without getting lawyers involved. And we even managed to turn a scroll shower scene into a jump scare. Ugh. Let's get stuck in. We start at the end of the last episode where Janaris has just got shot in the chest. This entire scene is over in 30 seconds. Largely because it doesn't make any sense. Get him in, do some flash forwards, and get him out so they can't think about it. Now the summary is Daenerys reads this scientist's mind, which includes all the scroll experiments that they've been doing. So she sticks it in the device, looks at DNA for a bit, runs into the microwave chamber, and turns into a super scroll so she can heal herself. Fine and dandy, you've saved yourself and ruined the ending of the last episode in the first 30 seconds of this one. But despite that, there's one main question. I have. Why is your scroll scientist locked up in a chamber where she can have her mind read at any time by any scroll at any point? That's where they put humans so that you can read their mind when you impersonate them. But why was a human experimenting on scrolls and how to turn them into super scrolls in the first place? Either you've got a scroll who took the mind of a human so she can experiment on scrolls and you kept the human in the base for some reason, or there was no scroll that was impersonating her on your own base because that wouldn't make any sense, and it was the human that was on your base experimenting on scrolls, and if that was the case, why have you got her locked up here anyway? The only reason I can work out why she's even here in the first place is, well, we, we need to read her mind and this is the only place we could do it. Either way, now she's immortal and that definitely won't cause problems in the future, I'm sure. We have a two minute intro sequence, four times longer than how you explained about one of your characters not dying, but don't worry, I'm sure we've got the correct priorities there. Stop thinking about it, if you think about it, it won't make any sense. Look, we've moved on, Fury's got a malty face, that's what matters now. The only way you can make this intro sequence even semi-bearable is at two times speed. <laughs> the music even sounds slow then. At least it sounds a bit more dramatic. We're in Paris. I'm not sure if those are electric lights or fires. Oh, it's 2012. France hadn't invented fire yet. Do you think it's good to offend an entire nation two minutes into your video? Probably not. I'm an Englishman, it's in my DNA. Well, we have Fury talking to his fancy woman. She says, as I was watching the news, I saw all of those Avengers doing their heroics in the States. I kept having this feeling that someone I know had something to do with getting them all together. You should have seen episode three, love. Fury did nothing. It was all the scrolls. He's useless. Basically tied yourself to a project manager. He's just the middleman that takes the cut while everyone else does the work. Oh, without me, that house wouldn't have been built. I mean, yes, everyone else built it, but I told them to be there. We've just offended project managers and the entire nation of France. See how more we can get done before the end of the episode. <laughs> Why is that your banner deadline? <laughs> Wait, BAFTA rules mandate movies have bullying and harassment policies in place. If you don't bully and harass your staff, there's no BAFTA for you. This is vital to the artistic experience. And what if it was someone you know? Well, it was. She knows the scrolls. Wouldn't surprise me. Because I know you're absolutely useless at everything. I didn't marry you because you're successful, Fury. I married you because you're an incompetent layabout. <laughs> Bush gives Fury this speech about how he's righteous and defends the weak that Earth is worth fighting for. And it would actually mean something if Fury was actually complimented for once in this series. Unfortunately, she's a spy trying to get in his pants, so it doesn't mean anything. Guess we go back to the Fury, you're all broken and useless. Have you considered taking the Indiana Jones route through life? I mean, he kind of does actually, now I think about it. But he asks her about the poetry book she's reading and whether she has a favorite one. It's a collection of poems, Raymond Carver. He's known for his brevity. Well, that's unfortunate. His poems can't be very satisfying. Some of his poems are just three or four lines. You consider that talent, but it, it's more likely laziness, isn't it? He does 20 minutes work, he's like, ah, that'll do. Put them in really big text on a page, they'll think it's art. But then she says her favourite poem. Well, she says it's a poem, it's a conversation between two people. Did you get what you wanted from this life? I did. And what did you want? To call myself beloved. To feel myself beloved on the earth. And we're like, oh, they got together, isn't it so nice? Need I remind you, at the start, we showed this very difficult to take this seriously on the rewatch, even more so when the next scene is her in a church. She's joined by War Machine, who's obviously a scroll, which we knew at the end of the last episode when he was on the phone to her. Also, the moment he started talking about how you deserved this smoke, you knew he had to come from outer space because no one from Earth could actually withstand so much cringe. You earned all this smoke, brother. Cringe! You need the improved alien muscular strength just so your head doesn't spontaneously explode. They discuss the firing of Fury, she says the president must have done it, and he goes, no, I did it. The president doesn't know anything unless I brief him on it. Which is how they're going to pretend that America doesn't know anything about the scrolls. Despite the fact that the British and everybody else know about the scrolls. Yes, apparently the only person that tells the president anything is this guy. That's believable. President Ritson doesn't find out that the sun's come up unless I brief him. I fired Fury. That one line is going to be the excuse 
excuse for America acting like complete fools for the entire series. <laughs> Anytime you go, how did they not know about this? Well, it's because of this one guy. But the meeting has a different plan. He tells her that she has to kill Fury. And Fury's there listening in. Must have been those husband instincts kicking in. The moment she started hiding her phone, he realized she must be seeing another bloke who's an alien from outer space that can shape change and wants to kill me. Oh, it's a story as old as time, isn't it? One of the two occupants of that lovely country manor of yours is catching a bullet today. Yeah, that is the other side of it. Either she kills Fury or War Machine kills her. But don't worry, she's a strong, independent type B and she's got a plan to get out of this. He's been broken ever since he came back from the blip. Yep, when in doubt, just repeat the theme of the entire series. Fury's old, useless, decrepit, can't do anything, and everything he's ever done, somebody else has done for him. This has gone beyond kicking a man when he's down. <laughs> she should have just said, I can't kill Fury, the show's already killed him. Essentially, you just want me to piss on his grave. The one with power, the one with ability, the one who was indispensable, that Fury's gone. The entertaining Fury, the one your customers wanted to see and give you money for. No, we got rid of him. What were you doing when you were writing? this, just throwing money onto a fireplace for inspiration. Well, this new one will be dead from exhaustion and defeat soon enough. Oh, we can only hope, love. There's three episodes to go. At the moment, the best thing we could hope for is they put him out of his misery so he can't be ruined further in other movies. You keep telling me what you're not gonna do. I'm gonna show you what I am going to do. I never really expected War Machine ASMR, I gotta be honest. What are we gonna get at the end? An advertisement for his Patreon? <laughs> I mean, he's a scroll he can turn into anybody. That's basically a license to print money. So at the end of that, Fury does what Fury does best. Cry. I'm not even joking, I think he's crying in the scene. You just can't tell because his eyes missed you already. It's incredibly difficult to cry through a contact lens. Back with the good guys now, we want to bring about the apocalypse. And his number one has realised that Queen Daenerys was in Game of Thrones, and so she probably isn't on their side. She's the mole. I'm really not sure what this acting's meant to be from him. Are you trying to intimidate him or kiss him? I still can't work it out. Or is it both? Look, it's Hollywood. I'm never going to underestimate one of their parties. I've already taken care of her. Unfortunately, she was unsatisfied, so she came back. But then we got a really strange sentence, which is almost the exact opposite of what I'd expect them to say. Remember, we want them to think it's the Russians. Make it big and loud, like the Russians would. I'm like, what? Haven't you been saying for years that they're actually everywhere lurking under your bed, manipulating everything from the shadows? And I was like, nah, they're just big, brash, and loud. They don't care if people know they're doing something. At this point, I don't even mind that you're lying to me. It's the incompetence while you're lying to me that I care about. It's just when you're offensively bad at it. That's what I mind. Over to the ducks now. Don't ask me, they're the ones that put them in the series. I'm just like a spot of bird watching in my spy drama, thank you very much. Is that a three-tailed diplodocus? I think it is. But no, it's the family of scrolls. They're on a bench, so that a satellite can spot them from outer space even easier. I don't know why in spy dramas they think they're really hard to spy on in the open. It makes it far easier for a parabolic microphone to get you. <laughs> it's harder to spy on people in a private room. Why is this complicated? I should never, ever have forced you into this. What? Are we watching the same show? He met her in a sewer when she was trying to cause the apocalypse. And he's like, I never should have forced you into this. No, she was already doing it. You just decided to instill some fatherly morality. I still don't know how you instilled it. It just kind of happened randomly for no reason whatsoever. But either way, that is the story. We essentially taught her that causing the apocalypse because a nine-year-old didn't get a Twinkie was a bad idea. I don't need your sorrow or your pity for anything I did of my own free will. Based economy. Look at him, he's like, what? I can't believe you won't let me take responsibility for your own actions. <laughs> Why are we so desperate to remove the agency of the person that was going to destroy the world? Well, I really wanted that to be my fault. Thank you very much. But she says, what I need from you is a plan. How are we going to find our people a home? Because remember, you went out into space and the entire universe hates because we have this horrible habit of wiping out every species we meet. I, d I have no idea why someone wouldn't let you into their home. And so the plan to get around this is to wipe out another species. Gravik has already implemented his, and it works. Yeah, but his plan is to wipe out an entire planet. It doesn't matter whether it works. It matters whether it makes you the most evil scum in the universe. We don't measure actions purely on their effectiveness. How come no one in this wrong? It's like, it's really immoral. At no point does anyone go, are we the baddies? But he says, okay, I've got a plan. First, we take down the insurgents. You, me, Fury. Just the three of them. Against the one million scrolls. I mean, even Fury before this series would have struggled three against one million people. But now we've found out he's broken, old, useless, and never done anything in his life because this guy is responsible for all of it. Yeah, I don't think it's gonna work, mate. My set's done. I like how you just skip over that bit. What's your plan? Well, we're just gonna save the world. Okay, but how? No, no, the next part of the plan is once that's done. Yeah, but how are you gonna do the first bit? That seems to be the difficult part of the problem. But okay, once it's done, magically, in three episodes. We go to the present and we have a big bargaining chip. Are you sure? Because he has the planet and you tried to destroy that planet. I'm not seeing where your cards are. We tell him 
Guess what? Just saved your planet. No, you didn't. You're the ones who put the planet in danger. <laughs> you can't try and cause the apocalypse and then stop it and claim that you saved the world. You're the one who put it in danger in the first- This is Reva all over again. Where Kenobi said she was a changed moral human because she saved Luke Skywalker's life. Despite the fact that she only saved Luke Skywalker from herself. If you try and kill somebody and stop yourself doing it, you're not a good person. Alright? Try and cause the apocalypse and don't do it, you're not a good person. <laughs> you can't end up morally positive from your own negative actions. That's not how it works. Now, give me a little something in return. Bullet to the face. <laughs> and wait and see what can happen next. You get spaced. We just start reenacting the 100, put you on a space station and see what happens. And I believe that I can secure an amnesty for the one million of us. The one million of you are the ones trying to cause the apocalypse. Why would you have an amnesty for the people causing the problems in the first place? Oh, I know you tried to destroy the planet, but we're just going to let you stay on it anyway. This is the most insane, unhinged, delusional speech in the entire series so far. Which is weird, because the episode actually improves after this. It's like we had to build up horrific momentum just so we could get escape velocity on the next scene. I saved a all my skill for the next one. Don't you want to live in your own skin? I mean, he's green, ugly, and a monster, so would you? We have to deal with reality. Nothing you've said so far in this scene has been reality. This is bordering on psychotic break. We depend on the goodwill of our hosts. That you're trying to nuke. I'm sorry, but at some point can we put two and two together? You can't depend on their goodwill while nuking them. If you want goodwill, you've got to behave. All of you. You can't have one million people of your one million people trying to nuke the Earth. We just have to keep showing them who we are. But who you are is trying to nuke them. Who you are is a people so horrific that the entire universe won't take you in. I'm not saying that. That's what you said in episode two. <laughs> you went out into the universe and everybody hated you because they knew what you were like. Let's just assume that every single person in the universe knows something that we don't. Combine that with you trying to murder all of us and let bygones be bygones. <laughs> Preferably with you pissing off somewhere else. Show them our hearts. But your hearts are full of the desire to wipe out every human on earth. You are delusional. <laughs> it never gets old. Who would have guessed that getting shot and killed would make her the voice of the audience? That's not who we are. Based economy. At least she's willing to admit the truth. Okay, so we're all one million of us trying to destroy the earth. Maybe we're not the good guys. And that is not who I've become. Exactly. Is that, oh, you're not responsible for your own actions. She tried to blow up the earth. And you're there going, just show them what's in your heart. She carried out three nuclear bombs a few episodes ago. The only time anyone should see her heart is if Blade is holding it. You can't look so shocked, mate. Like, let's just show them who we are. She's like, yes, that's the problem. I genuinely don't know how he thinks his plan is going to work. Unless he's just thinking that only him and his daughter are going to survive at the end of it. Back at the wife with the seven-year itch. And she found Fury's taking his ring off. For some reason, though, he's in the kitchen making tea. They're in France, acting surprisingly British. I don't really get it. Either way, I do commend it. But he tells her putting the ring on just slipped my mind. Too busy thinking about how you were going to brutally slaughter me in my sleep. But there's a lot of staring at each other, and uh, I think at this point, they both know that they both know. Of all the dumbass things I've done, you are the greatest mistake. Okay, where's Fiori and what have you done with him? This is more like Daenerys has shapeshifted into him at this point. I lost all my reason to be your husband. Yeah, there's a lot of that in this scene. This is a scene where they actually allow him to act and it's a genuinely good scene. No one was more surprised about that than me. <laughs> they hit the emotional notes between the characters. They act it very well. It's fully believable. And at no point does she go, you're a broken, useless old man and I'm glad you're gone. <laughs> they actually managed to put the preaching away for one single scene and it worked. It's amazing. I ignored every signal in my head, heart and body that screamed stop because she's an alien spy that wants to assassinate you and at no point did you think i should have probably just gone no i'm gonna sit around a table with a person that wants to shoot me in the face <laughs> but he takes out his gun and puts it on the table she takes hers and puts it on the table the thing is he takes his hand off his gun she never does why are we trusting this alien spy from another planet that wants to destroy the earth again i just i can't work it out also no one poured any tea i'm quite disgusted i'm more disgusted about you wasting tea than trying to assassinate each other to be quite frank but he asked her to explain her form. Why did you choose this person in particular? We get a story about how she went to the hospital and kept meeting her over and over again. It was a woman on her deathbed who she slowly learned about her life piece by piece. All because she was looking for somebody who could get around Fury's defences. And the person she was talking to had a congenital heart defect and she didn't want any of her friends and family to know so they didn't worry about her. So you playing the long game on me even then? Don't do that, Nick. Don't do what? Be honest with you. No, don't realise that I'm a horrible manipulative cow who's been trying to spy on you from the very beginning. How am I supposed to manipulate you and win if you realise what I am? Don't you understand? The weak only win if you don't call them out and let them get away with it. 
when they... I'm not sure why he just lets her get away with it. No, she's a spy who was deliberately manipulating you right from the very start, and now it's her job to kill you. Should be fine to call that out. But the surprising thing is, before the woman was about to pop her clogs, she actually asked her, can I do this? To which the woman agreed. Oh, of course I'd like this scroll person to impersonate me and become a spy. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Even if you've got the air of, I'm about to die, screw it. I don't know, it just seems a little bit far. You asked if you could assume her life. I asked if she wanted to fall in love. Okay, so you lied to her too. Got it. Making a lot more sense now. But in response, the woman made her make three promises. Now remember, this is a spy who's already manipulating you and is intent on destroying the Earth. So her promise is not exactly cast iron at this point. Either way, the first was that she would bury her at sea. Two, that I would continue to be a daughter to her parents. Great. It's like when your goldfish dies as a kid and your parents are like, don't worry, I've got you a new goldfish. They're just interchangeable. It doesn't matter. This is literally like Disney remaking their IPs. Yeah, we've completely changed its soul, but it's got the same face. That's what matters. <laughs> She's essentially remade their daughter for a modern audience. Although to be fair, this is far better than most Disney remakes, as at least she was cast by someone who looks like the original. <laughs> Just may have to put up with some other changes, like I'm now dating Sally. Three. Please don't nuke the earth. That'd be a good start. At this point, that's humanity's only hope. That I would never hurt you. Well, we're crap out of luck on that one, aren't we? <laughs> we're gonna break that promise the entire way down. Firstly, we are spying on him to manipulate his actions and give that information back to somebody else. That's gonna hurt him already. Let alone shooting him in the head or nuking the entire planet. I have a feeling any of those things would be breaking this promise. So much for good things coming threes. I'm sorry, darling. But I've got to shoot you in the head. I made this promise that I knew I was going to break, but unfortunately, here we are. And did you get what you wanted from this life? Yeah, we do start doing this bit. We go back to her famous poem, the conversation at the start. And so we do the back and forth. He asks the question, she responds the answer. I did. And what was that? To call myself beloved. Before I shot him in the head and destroyed the earth. <laughs> The poem remix is going to be a bit different once we've just updated it for accuracy. To feel myself so beloved on the uh. earth. I mean, I gotta give it to him. It's one hell of an ending. If every bad poem ended like that, I have a feeling the writing talent would increase dramatically. But as the pair discovered that that was the fastest way to get a divorce without a lawyer, obviously this show ended in episode three and we won't get to episode six without Fury. That is the problem with having a show based around Nick Fury. You know what must have happened there, especially when they cut to her first. Because out of anyone in this, she's the only one that could die. Yeah, nobody cares if his wife, who nobody knew about before this series, doesn't reach the end of the series, but Fury has to survive, we know he's in the Marvels. So if anything, you should have cut to him first. Probably looking very scared and disappointed and upset with himself, and then cut to her. As it is, she's like, oh, you missed. I mean, she's probably not even sure whether it was deliberate or whether he's just so old, useless and past it that he couldn't even aim to begin with. Maybe a scroll actually did all the aiming for him before. I'm not sure if this means we should get divorced. You should definitely get divorced. You tried to shoot each other in the face. I mean, her making you go and see Barbie is probably bad as it is. But if you want to shoot each other in the face, just yes. Let's call that an exception. Or well, we should renew our vows. <laughs> no, if you wanted to renew your vows, not firing the gun in the first place would be a good idea. I don't even know why you would raise your gun and fire if you were just planning to miss in the first place. Just don't raise your gun. Unless you're trying to cause the other one to shoot you. But him making her shoot him when him dying results in the apocalypse, that's not a good thing. They'll be coming for you. So at least there's an upside. It's always nice. Would you have loved me if I'd never changed? If I'd been my true self? What? As a scroll, a big giant green alien monster creature? No! It's like if your girlfriend comes to you and goes, would you have still loved me if I was a slug? And when you tell them no, they start crying. Don't you think you're taking this a little bit far, love? I would have dumped you if you put on half a stone. I don't know what a stone is for my American friends. I would have dumped you if you put on seven pounds. Doesn't really have the same ring to it, does it? <laughs> That'll be a no love. Not answering is the answer. I don't want to offend you just in case this time you actually do shoot me in the face. But then he turns back. Oh, just one more thing. Maybe I will answer. Guess we'll never know. I'm sorry, I might need a moment to cope with the quality of that script writing. The fact that you don't know is a no, just in case anyone was wondering. But then we dive over to a scroll shower scene. That is not a sentence I ever expected to say. <laughs> but like after that scene, you're gonna need something hot and steamy. This is definitely a type B scroll or a voice two. Why do type Bs and voice twos need to cover their chest, but type As and voice ones don't? We'll never know. Don't ask about it. Don't even think about it. In the UK, we have literal thought police. Just, just don't. They know. But then just he's like, okay, that's definitely type B features and you can see why they want to be human. I mean, look at their arms. You transform, you instantly go up five points at the very least. 
Oh. Top 10 movie disappointments. And can we just all get on board that this is at least on the Tropic Thunder level, right? Like, it has to be. If people want to get annoyed at Tropic Thunder, you've got to get annoyed at this as well. But as he leaves the shower, Fury's already there. Now, your first thought would be, does he know I'm a scroll? Because if he just looked in that door at any point, he's going to know. Actually, why are we transforming into a scroll when we're in the shower? Is it the only way to wash among all the different grooves? But War Machine says, what are you even doing here? I fired you days ago. I didn't like the way we left things between us the other day. Still better than how you left things with your wife, to be fair. Us brothers gotta stick together, you know what I mean? And you thought you'd demonstrate that by breaking and entering. I don't even know if that one was intentional. This is the problem, Disney. When you produce so much tripe, when you say something like that, it's like, was that accidental or deliberate? I don't know whether I should give you credit. Your customers don't even know if they should give you credit when you do something funny. But Fury's bought a bottle of whiskey, five grand's worth, and he wants to share it with him. Rule one of being a spy, don't eat or drink anything anyone ever gives you. We're just gonna break that. Should I be worried about poison? Poison? No. Nano checks. The weird thing is, is actually being honest with him. If you're a spy and another spy tells you that he's put nano trackers in your drink. Don't drink the drink. Someone tells you they're doing something. Believe them. And at first he doesn't trust him. He goes to drink it, watches Fury drink his, and just puts the glass down without taking any. So instead he just asks him why he's really here. There are scrolls inside the US government. You've already told him this, and he already knows it. This again? See, when you said there were scrolls in his security, he said, I already know this. I was briefed on it years ago. Why aren't you going to somebody else and telling them instead? So he just carries on. I have excellent authority. There's a scroll mole by the president. As close as us. Closer. Meaning you. <laughs> Wow, really? How close? Close as you and I are right now. Uh, closer. I mean, yeah, you're taking the piss out of him to his face, but it's not really going to achieve anything. And it still doesn't explain why you're not telling other people about it. All you got to do, keep my mouth shut about all this? Give me my job back. Yeah, it's an odd blackmail strategy. I don't even know how he thinks it's going to work, or it's even meant to be perceived as if that's what he's actually attempting to do. Give me my job back, or a leak that the scrolls in the US government, and it's like, well, okay, but I already know that. The entire American government already knows that, or at least should be warned about it because it seems like a major deal. You mind if I make a counter? I don't understand. Fiori obviously doesn't understand. It's like, okay, I wanted you to drink the whiskey, but you drank the whiskey as a counter offer to me? This doesn't make any sense. I told you there were nano trackers in it. But it seems to be some sort of power play. As he grabs a USB stick, he's like, oh, by the way, this is you shooting one of your own agents in Russia. You and I both know that's graphic. Is that really what you're gonna go with? At your trial? Yes. It's a very reasonable excuse, actually. In fact, I don't know why everyone else doesn't use it. The moment you know there are scrolls on Earth, and you know there are scrolls on Earth, it's not me, it's someone pretending to be me, and there's a million of them on this planet is a very reasonable excuse. Like, even in this, with the technology, you'd think they'd be able to fake video. Maybe they've got video to detect fake video. But scrolls make any video entirely irrelevant. But instead, he gets blackmailed back. As long as you just shut up about the scrolls, I'll keep this secret. And all the copies I made of it. But what I can have is the rest of this pappy, because baby, <laughs> this is fire. All those episodes of House of Lies coming in handy there. Tell you what, why don't you hobble your ancient ass on out of here before I have you defenestrated? I had to look up defenestrated. Literally means the act of throwing throwing someone out of a window. That is a word I've got to use more often. <laughs> it's incredible. Either way, Fury leaves with his tail between his legs. I mean, at this point with the amount of scrolls around, Fury might actually be one and have a tail, I don't know. But War Machine pours himself another drink of the bottle, despite the fact that he's already been told it's got trackers in it. And it does have trackers in it. Liquid location tracker. When Fury tells you something has a tracker in it, just believe him. It's not a bad idea. It is if you tell them it's got it in it. But Fury uses that to track him to the next location, where he meets the president. Come over to negotiate and he tells him, look, the Russians respect strength. And Vladimir had a quote himself, if you find mush, push, if you find steel, withdraw. Now he changes the words and kind of implies that, that the retreat is just, they back away. That's not actually what I think he meant. It was more like withdraw so you can go again. <laughs> Keep pressing until you find mush. But they like to think that no, you're just strong and they back away. Although the whiskey seems to have a secondary effect. Did you pre-game for our bilateral with the Russians or the half a bottle of bourbon? I mean, he did, but I have a feeling that that was Fury's um, little additive. You have a couple of drinks and it just makes you smell like a brewery. <laughs> or a distillery in this case, I guess. Either way, they all set off. They've got a big long convoy with what looks like a caravan in the middle of it. Okay, it's not a caravan, it's a big silver people carrier. From the top, it looked white. And War Machine's on the phone telling everyone that Citadel is in car number four, which is to these guys, who are in armed, rocket-carrying helicopters. Stop blowing cars up out the sky. There's more action in this one scene than there has been in the rest of the entire series combined. So they blow up a couple of cars, one of which has the president in it. For some reason, he's all the way over here on the screen. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty impressive car crash. I mean, there's cars rolling all over the place. 
smashing into each other on fire upside down, considering the rest of this series has cost about two quid. I'm actually surprised they even had the budget for this. Although this episode is half an hour rather than an hour, which probably is because they blew all the budget in about five minutes. So all the cars break, because we've got to protect the president, and Fiore panics as he's driving parallel to them along the roads as if, oh no, I never saw this coming. I don't know why you thought scrolls that were trying to blow up the earth wouldn't do something like this, but you know, here we are. But at this point, there's a load of people who get out rifles. None of these people seem to have military training because they're just standing out in the open most of the time, not behind cover or anything. And they try and get their head honcho out. So all the soldiers pour out the vans as the scrolls arrive in their cars, and these two just abseil down from the helicopter. Just stand out in the open. Oh, I'll be fine, love. Yeah, just shoot me. I don't need cover. I'll just stand in the middle of the road and never get hit by a bullet. Now, I know he's immune to bullets. Doesn't explain why he doesn't get hit by any, though. And even though he's immune, the guys next to him also pour out the van. They don't take cover either. And one of them goes down. Why didn't we get out the van on the other side and then use the van as cover? Please. <laughs> During all of this, War Machine is just sitting in his car. I'm surprised they didn't have him playing, like, Genshin Impact on his phone or something. A rocket pops out the top of one of the vans, takes down helicopter number one. I mean, for a TV show, I'm very happy with that. Even wipes out a couple of guys. Meanwhile, the stupid idiots with no cover start advancing forwards. <laughs> I don't know why they're not getting shot. So the van fires at the other helicopter, misses, and promptly gets blown up itself. I mean, yes, it's almost certainly CGI explosions, but look at it. I take that for a TV series. Of course, it does get a little bit stupid when Fury drives up in a van behind the Skrulls, who all promptly ignore him. <laughs> they get guns out the back of the car, including a little mini rocket launcher, which takes out the helicopter, which was just about to blow up the overturned Citadel car. So then the two of these guys pr approach behind the Skrulls, who don't turn around and just shoot him. In fact, the helicopter that he blew up almost wipes out Citadel just from spinning blades as it flew towards it. So we're a little bit lucky about that one. Meanwhile, everything's on fire. Fury starts shotgunning everybody in sight, including this guy who gets shot and is fired back like out of a cannon. <laughs> That's got a sting. Fury's here. Yeah, mate, you don't have to sound so calm about it. Oh no, it's the only guy in the world that we're scared of. Even the Daleks were more scared when Doctor Who turned up. And to be fair, this guy at least looked a little bit scared, which is legitimately the most acting he's done in the entire series. Didn't even say a word for it. I was really impressed. So the humans in this scenario are not doing very well. They're all falling over at a record pace. And then the Super Scroll realizes, hey, I'm immune to bullets. Why am I standing behind this car? I can just walk at them and engage in some Japanese fun time with this guy. Oh, we got the extended tentacles and everything. I'm not exactly sure he's into it, but let's face it, this is Disney. Probably is. He seemed especially tired afterwards. But at that moment, backup arrives for the human. Humans. I don't know why or where they came from or how they got here so fast. Don't question it, just assume they teleported. But they're amazed that Fury's arrived and escort him to the car. Now at this point, they've got a problem because that car is armored and no one's been able to get in. I've got this, stand back man. Oh, he's gonna break the window for him. This ought to be good. Why are you punching the window, mate? I'm not being funny, but what do you think you're doing? There's absolutely no way we're going to say that a scroll's fist has more power than a gun, right? We can't be saying that. A gun can fire at hundreds of rounds per minute and you're just going to punch it. And let's just say that you are stronger than a bullet. Why didn't you hit it with a metal pole? Metal has got to be stronger than your knuckles, surely. There's got to be a more efficient way to do this is all I'm saying. Nobody else says anything though, so as yeah. far as Fury's concerned, it's all perfectly normal. This guy panics though and sends his handyman round to take him out. So he gets a flanking angle and shoots Talos in the chest. Turns out the car can't be that strong though because he just starts smacking it from behind and still breaks the window. The problem is one of the soldiers sees him in the window and at this point he's transforming back into a skull because he's been shot. Turns out it's very easy to work out whether someone's a scroll or not. You can just like injure them a bit and they start turning back. These one million people in all the powerful positions should be really easy to find out. Is that- oh, is it alien shoot him luckily fury covers him he's like no no trust me yes he's an alien but he's the only one out of one million scrolls who's actually a good guy so eventually they break in save citadel and fury takes him back to his car meanwhile a soldier comes along and picks up talos but when fury turns around and sees him he realizes something's very wrong with this put him down or i'll put you down because when he doesn't move he realizes he's a scroll and, and to be fair acts really quite like fury in that he just shoots him. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, you're a human and you haven't replied to me, so I think you're a scroll. I'm not sure, but I think so. Yeah, I might as well shoot you anyway. That'll find out. Of course, when he shoots him, he transforms back into the main villain who promptly finishes off Talos. My face when I know another episode of Secret Invasions on this week. So Fury goes full stereotype. No! 
Wu-Wan just starts unloading on him, shoots the guy in his face, which admittedly is more gory than I expected for a Disney show. The guy just heals it right back up again, with glowing red eyes like the Terminator. It's a cool moment in the show. Oh no! <laughs> Secret Invasion's on again! But then, as even more backup arrives, everyone decides they need to get out of here. The villain escapes on a motorbike, and Fury has a choice, do I save Talos or the Citadel? He goes for the Citadel, although really does hesitate quite a lot over the choice. I mean, the other guy is literally surrounded by military with helicopters coming in. If he's gonna get medical care fast, that's the fastest way anyway. So I think he made the right decision. Although Talos is probably gonna complain about this as well, like he does everything else. That is, if he's not dead. But overall, this episode was a big step up from the others. Yeah, okay, it was just as trash at first. There were some really horrifically bad bits, just like the rest of the season has been. But there are also some decent scenes in this. The fight at the end, I thought, well, okay. Yeah, it's not amazing, and all the people in it act like idiots. You know, like the president's convoy doesn't have anything to detect aircraft coming in. Everyone's just standing out in the open, not carrying out cover at all. At one point they shout, IT'S THE RUSSIANS! Despite the fact the only evidence they have for that is they were speaking the language, and they know scrolls exist. And of course, we're breaking windows with our fists rather than guns, or even any other tool with that guy's fists. And obviously, that scene was basically to show you. They're not all the same. No, one out of one million is different. Congratulations. But as the rest of them do want to cause the apocalypse, it's still not going to change anyone's mind. But despite that, I did like the scene between him and his wife. It was actually emotional, well acted, and without all of the other nonsense that has been in the rest of the season. I even like the scene between him and War Machine, even though it was completely nonsensical if you think about it for a second. And the shower troll jump scare with the scroll was hilarious, even if probably accidental. Just like every other time I I'm pretty sure that was accidental as well. And that's the main issue with a show like this. Most of it is so bad that when they do something funny, you're like, okay, I don't think you meant that. I'm not sure I could even give you credit for that because I'm not sure it's intentional when the rest of it is so awful. But despite this, the second half, definitely a big step up from the rest of the season so far. So is this a sign that the show is changing or, or was this just a lucky writer who had slightly more morals than everybody else so far? I guess we'll have to wait and see. But one thing I do know is that this whole, oh, the scrolls are just good and we've just got to show them our heart after they've been trying to cause the apocalypse isn't going to fly no matter how much you try and make it so because the scrolls are pure evil. Everybody else in the entire universe knows it, which is why they couldn't get a planet in the first place. I don't know why you're trying to betray the scrolls as the good guys, but whatever that reason is, it's not gonna work. But those are just my thoughts, what are yours? Let me know down in the comments below, like the video if you like the video, subscribe for more videos like this in the future and I will see you in the next one. Bye bye.